again, we greet you in the name of Jesus. He is the mediator. He's the everlasting one. And we, in our human bodies, we are on this earth, mortal beings, and we are looking towards an immortal God and one that can bring us to immortality. So we thank God for his calling. Thank God for his bringing us out of this world of sin and darkness and making us children of light. It's good to see each of you again. Some here I haven't seen in a while. We just wish you to each and every one the blessing of the Lord. And also before I get into the message, I want to thank the church here for all that you have done, for all the good meals, fellowship, and it seems like it, uh, I guess this, this congregation to me seems kind of like <coughs> our people at home. And I, I have enjoyed the fellowship here. And God bless each of you as you endeavor to look to the future, you endeavor to, to find the will of God for your life now. And as you look into the future, sometimes the future seems rather quiet and rather unsure. But one thing we know, that we trust the one that holds the future in his hands. The one that holds the very, that, that controls the very air that we breathe. Time and space are in his hands. When I think about that, you know, man sends these vehicles out to outer space and they marvel at their, at their discoveries. God is already there. By the word of his mouth, these things were made. Man is just marveling at the things that, he, that God has allowed him to do. And so, anyways, we want to thank you. Thank Brother Laverne and his wife for sharing with us the nice basement to stay in. It's, it's a very nice place to be. Our van broke down. Somebody fixed the van and paid for it. I appreciate that very much and may God bless the folks that done that. I told the minister this morning, I don't know who, who done that. I know who fixed it, but I, I wasn't sure who paid for it. I said, I'm not worthy of that. As we get to the message this evening, for this evening, for the last evening of this series, for this week of meetings, I've challenged us in, in a number of ways this week, and I, I trust that, that it's been a blessing to you as it has been a blessing to me. As I think about the evening message, the last message of this 
this week of this, these revival meetings, I was just challenged to just simply take the word of God and talk about, speak about what the Bible says, what is the anticipation of the Christian man, of the Christian person, of the Christian people. And I've entitled the message this evening, The Day of the Lord. How many of us are anticipating the coming of the Lord? We, I see hands going up everywhere. And as we anticipate the coming of the Lord, you know, it, it just seems like it, it builds an excitement, doesn't it? In our hearts and lives. And I believe that as we anticipate the coming of the Lord, as we look around us and we see the signs of the times, that we should be just become more excited. But then we have, we have an adversary that wants to hinder us. We all struggle with the adversary, his kingdom, his angels. And I brought that out one evening, how that Satan himself comes to us as a roaring lion. He comes to us as an angel of light. And it is up to us to discern. Because his powers are more than I as a human being can withstand. And I have to look to this resurrected Jesus. His power and the power of the blood to overcome, as I've already mentioned the other night. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Second Peter. As we think about the day of the Lord. Second Peter talks about various things. Talks about the Christ coming to judgment. I'm going to read. Let's read the, the first 14 verses. Second Peter chapter 3. The second epistle, beloved, now I write unto you, both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this, first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hosting, hasting, I'm sorry, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall meet with, melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And this one thing I notice as we read this scripture is that as a Christian people, as a people of faith, as a people that believe in God, that is something that we anticipate, we look forward to, and we are not ashamed of, of the fact 
that we are looking forward to this day because this day is nothing but a deliverance for God's people. But we're living in a time, my friends, we're living in a time and God challenged us as he challenges us as he challenged the Pharisees and the scribes back in his day. He says, read, you can't read the signs of the times. God wants us to read the signs of the times. You know, we can read the weather. We can just go to our phones and see that anymore. But as we look at the signs of the times, I believe he is, he is challenging us that we should take the scripture and see what the scripture talks about when it talks about the end of the age. Because there are certain things that are going to happen at the end of the age that hadn't really happened as time goes uh, in time past. You know, in other words, there is a progression to ungodliness. I believe to a certain extent, all, some of these, many of these things, most of these things have happened down through the ages, but it seems like there's a progression of becoming worse and worse. And here it says, as, as Peter was writing, he says that ye may be mindful of the words which were before, which were spoken before by the holy prophet, prophets and of commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And we can go into the, the, uh, the book of the prophets, Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and, and many of the prophets in the Old Testament. And Daniel especially talks about the end of the age and gives to us some perspective about the, the end times. As the angel talked to him and, and, and gave him some direction as he wrote these things. And we know that all these scriptures are given to us by God as they spake to us through the holy prophets. It is not a word that was, that was compiled by some man by himself. But there was like 66, 66 writers, I understand, that wrote the scriptures... And they all conform. The truths all, they all relate. And then he goes on to say, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking in their own lusts. After their own lusts. As we look at, the, at our time, at the age we're living in, do we see scoffers walking around? And one thing that, that, one thing that, that burdens me is that there used to be a greater, a greater sense of God-fearing, even in the leaders of our country. But today it seems like the, un, the, the spirit of ungodliness is prevailing, even in the leaders of the country. I'm not saying that all of the people in Washington are corrupted. But as I look at the news and the things that we look at, it, it, is, it is kind of... And, and, it seems to me like, I've said already, you know, this, there's things have to happen. As we look at the end of the age, it seems like things are going to have to start happening. But that's just my perspective. As I look at the scriptures and I see what the Bible says about the end times, scoffers walking after their own lusts, and... Then, then here's another thing they say. Have you ever heard this? Where is the promise of his coming? For th since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Isn't that something we hear from time to time? You know, as we 
as we testify to people around, they will scoff at you and they will say, you know, can you imagine how, how Noah felt? Maybe we can even do, do a little imagining here. As Noah was building the ark on dry ground, do you think that's kind of the perspective that people have of us as Christian people? As we profess God in us and we tell the people the end is near, that the Lord is coming, it's imminent, and that we need to prepare, we need to make ready. But no. My Bible says, many are called, but few are chosen. And it seems as we get closer to the end of the age that that statement becomes more meaningful. Because there is such deceit. There is such ungodliness. There is and deceit in this, in this world today. So many people claim to be godly and still do not uphold the principles of God's word. See, and this is, this is where it, the word of God is where we find direction. Not in a, another man's thoughts or philosophy or theology, but the word of God and the basis of our belief should be on the word of God not other people. And as we look at the, at, the, at the end of the age, Jesus and the apostles, they taught us about some of the things that shall come to pass. And we should have our eyes open. We should beware. As Jesus told his disciples, when, when uh, Jesus told them about the destruction and, and about the end of the age. And the disciples said, tell us, when shall these things be? And the first words that Jesus told them is beware. Beware. And so tonight, I would like to warn us as well. Beware. Lest the end of the age come upon us and we are not prepared. And it says, for this they willingly are ignorant. So I believe, my friends, brothers and sisters, I believe that there are many people that have been taught the word of God and have simply turned their backs and are walking away from the word of God and making a mockery. of God's word and God himself. And I believe that is serious when we do such things. Then it talks about the heavens of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And I would like to mention Noah here. We might feel sometimes a little like Noah. You know, God told Noah to build an ark. Where did he build the ark? Where did God build the ark? Not God, Moses, uh, Noah. <laughs> On dry land. That's right. So what do you think the people thought? Noah, God told Noah it's going to rain. It's going to flood. Think about floods down in Mexico. I was down there last month. Large area flooded, flooded. They had 40 inches of rain. Large areas flooded. But it wasn't like the flood that Noah, that in the time of Noah. But God told Noah to build an ark on dry land. And Noah started building an ark, and how long did it take Noah to build an ark? 120 years. Was it 120 years? It was a long time. How many, how, how many people here have seen 120 years? Nobody. Nobody. 
And Noah began building the ark, and him and his family faithfully were working at it day after day after day. Can you imagine pulling the logs up and sawing the logs, the timber out, and, and all this work that they had to do? And it was all based on, on God's word, what God had told them was going to happen. And God gave him direction as to what to do to prepare himself and his family. And so Noah, for a hundred plus years, built the ark. And when the time came, Noah went into the ark safe and sound. And God closed the gate. And it began to rain. So now the people that scoffed and made fun of Noah as he preached righteousness to the people began to be concerned. So they, I can just imagine, I had, we had a, a children's storybook back when I was small. And there was a picture of Noah's ark and it was beginning to float and people outside in the water, they were just beating on that ark, beating on the ark. Too many times, my friends, people are caught in the sin of unbelief. But when the things get serious and, and go beyond the possible... Then they want to make things right. When the truth is revealed, says the heavens of old, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. You see what this is? Did you hear what this said? It says, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store. So for a hundred and plus years, as Noah built the ark, God kept his word. And he was holding back this flood. Because a man of righteousness was out there building this ark. Building that which was salvation to him and his family. Well, to us, the ark has been built. Jesus Christ already died on the cross. And gave us that security. And so God give us his word. And we build upon. And, and we, as we go forth. His word should flow through us. To those around us. We will be scoffed at. We will be mocked. We will be made fun of. But our anchor is still in the word of God. Jesus Christ and the power that we receive through him. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 14. Hmm. Have a wrong reference here. But it's talking about unbelief. And I would like to speak just a little bit about Unbelief. Let's turn to 16. Let's read what verse 24. Let's read this. In chapter, in chapter 16, verses, this is after Jesus was speaking to the disciples. To, was it Peter here? Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, 
And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of the Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. For I say unto you, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. There are some principles that we need to understand as we, as we weave our way through in the web of life and we maintain our Christian witness that we, it, it seems counterproductive. We need to die to live. That is kind of an oxymoron. We need to die to live. We need to lose to save. And that is a principle in the kingdom of God as we look in his word and what it means to us. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. We're talking about unbelief. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And, but exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast. While it is said, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some when they had heard did provoke, howbeit not all came out of Egypt by Moses. But with them was he grieved forty years. With whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? To whom and to whom he swore that he should not enter his, into his rest, excuse me, and to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So, so the fact that there are people living in unbelief, but we as a Christian people do not live in unbelief. Our faith is in the living God. Our faith is in the living word. Our faith is in the one who holds the future. And so, to those that do not believe, have no sure foundation of anything. They have no future. They just have the present to live for. And we as a Christian people need to share, shore each other up. We need to keep talking to one another. Keep encouraging one another. Because you have battles that I don't know about. In your inner heart, there may be doubts. There may be fears. There may be things that, that you face that I don't know about. I'm facing things that you don't know about. And as we express to one another and confess to one another. It shores up our faith, our courage, and our strength to be faithful until God calls us home. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Here it talks about the rich man, Lazarus, verse 19, Jesus said there was this rich man. It doesn't say here he spake in a parable, 
But he said there was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain poor man. There was a beggar. His name was Lazarus. Which was laid in, at the gate of at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now we see what happened to the two. The rich man died and was buried. Where was he when he lifted up his eyes? In hell. And this is what he said. Being, he says he was in, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Let's go on and read, finish, this, finish the reading here, then I'll come back. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us, there is a gulf fixed so that they can, which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then said he, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. What did Abraham tell him? They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went Unto them from the dead they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now there's a number of things in this, in this portion of Scripture that I would like to point out. As the rich man, it says Lazarus, he died and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. In other words, the meaning is he was carried into glory. And it says the rich man died also. And it says in hell he lifted up his eyes. In hell, he lifted up his eyes. Now, hell is a place that I, could, I cannot explain to you the terribleness of what it really is. But it's a place void of God. It is a place full of ungodly people, of sinners that have died. And if this rich man was in hell at the time of Jesus, eternity, he is still in hell. What did he ask Moses to, I mean, yes, Abraham. He wanted, he wanted just, just to have a little drop of water on his tongue. That's how terrible the place was. One thing we have to understand. When we die, it is final. It says in Matthew, as a tree layeth, falleth, so shall it lay. And there is no recourse. 
As a tree falleth, so shall it lay. And we are making decisions day by day. But we all have to make one important decision, and that is coming to Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the one that can save us from this awful place. But I, I would rather that people come to Jesus recognizing their own failures, their own sins, and come to Jesus for salvation from their sins than, than when I preach about the awfulness of hell. I'm not trying to scare anybody into the kingdom of God. It is a decision you personally have to make for yourself, recognizing the fact that we are all sinners. And that Jesus died to save us from these sins. And that if we don't accept that, we go to hell when we die. Matthew chapter 7. Let's turn to that. Jesus talks about the straight and narrow way. Verse 13 and 14. It says here, Enter in at, ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Now let's go to verse 21. Not every one not, not that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you not prophesied in thy name, and that I, in thy name have we cast out devils, thy name have done many wonderful things. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Therefore, and he goes on, he talks about the rains that descended and the floods that came and the one house stood and the other did not. But what is he saying here? There is a wide road and there is a narrow road. On the wide road, there are many. There are many on the wide road. But on the narrow, straight and narrow way, there are but few. Brothers and sisters, how do we base the decisions we make from day to day? What do we base those on? And what does that have to do with the broad road and the narrow road? You know, when... When I make a decision based on what is popular, based upon the end things, because I want those things, that is what everybody is looking for. That's what everybody wants to do. It doesn't mean that I always have to do the opposite, but I weigh the consequences of the decisions I'm making whether it is the right thing to do or not, by the word of God, and whether it is, it is taking away or adding. Uh, taking away, in other words, whether it is a detriment to my own spiritual life, because I want to maintain a, the walk on the narrow way. And it is not based upon what the popular people or the, or the general public is doing. But the Bible teaches the principles of separation and non-conformity. And the principles of separation and non-conformity, it, it involves everything we do, think, and say. It involves the things we read. It involves the, thoughts, the songs we sing. It involves the people we, 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 we become friends with. It involves our fellowships. 
the principles of separation and nonconformity. But here it says that there are many that are going to say, Lord, didn't I do this for you? Didn't I go have prison services for you? Didn't I do many good things for you? But there is something about the heart of these people that the Lord did not accept. And they were, they were like, Lord, Lord, didn't we, didn't we prophesy in thy name? Didn't we preach your name? Prophesying, preaching. And that is one thing we need to be aware of, brothers and sisters, is that there are many pro false prophets out there. Even preaching the name of Christ. And we have to weigh it, what they are saying by the word of God. We have to be careful. And you even have to weigh the words that I say. And compare it with the word of God. To make sure I am not teaching anything false. But the pure holy doctrine of God. And if I say something false... Please correct me. Brother Laverne, you'll have that chance this evening, maybe. That's how serious the work of God really is as we continue to build, per se, the ark in our time. None of us have been here 120 years. But we do not become discouraged because the promise has not been fulfilled yet. But there is a continual looking forward and a looking up in our Christian walk, knowing that God's promise is true. God's word does not fail. It says in Matthew, not one jot or one tittle of the word shall fail until it all shall be fulfilled. And that is where we as a Christian people stand on, is the un infallible word of God. There are many people on the broad and narrow way. Coming back to the subject of hell, hell is never a comfortable place, comfortable, a comfortable subject, not place, but subject to preach on. Is it right for we as preachers to preach on hell? I'll tell you what our bishop normally said, told us, or told us several times. He warned us, he said, we have to preach on hell. It's because we dare not Preach anything but the truth. In the Bible, the truth of the Bible speaks about hell and its awfulness. We dare not shun to preach the truth. We preach the blessing of, of God. And, you know, I find many times we as preachers, we like to preach on the blessings of God, which is good. It is good. But when it comes to preaching on, on the doctrines of judgment and hell and, and some of those, you know, many times we tend to maybe shun those subjects. But we have to be reminded, reminded of these subjects. We have to be reminded of these truths. If you're a drowning man, this is, this is a, I, quote, I wrote this, a few things down here. If you are a drowning man, and I have the gospel, the gospel light boat of life, I need to attempt to save you. If you are a starving man, and I had the bread of life, 
I would attempt to feed you. If you are a poison man and I have the gospel antidote, I will attempt to give you the antidote and not leave you to die. If you are in, in the dark and lost and I have the light of the gospel, I'll not leave you alone. If you are in bondage, I would speak to you the truth and bring to you liberty. If you are on the broad road, I will speak to you the truth and bring you to, to the road of law, to the to the road to life. If you're on the stormy sea, I will speak to you the truth and bring you to the harbor of safety. Brothers and sisters, in this warfare, there is no neutral. There is no neutral. I heard one preacher say that there was a man in the Civil War that said, I'm going to be neutral. And he said, so he said, the man put on a blue pair of pants and a gray shirt. And he was chased around and shot at by both sides. In this, kingdom, in this warfare, we are either in the kingdom of God or we are not. There is no neutral. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking to his disciples. His disciples actually ask him a question. As they departed from the temple, Jesus said, Look at here. Look at these stones. Not one stone shall be, shall remain on the other. Well, it, it was true. Not one stone remained to the other, on, on top of the other, because they were inlaid with gold. And the Romans came and destroyed the temple to take the gold that was inlaid in all these stones. But Jesus was telling them other truths as well. The disciples asked him, says, tell us, what shall these, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed. So I mentioned a while ago, Jesus' first words to his disciples when they ask him this question is, take heed. And that is my warning to us today. Take heed. Know your Bible. Know your God. My God. We have to personally know him in order to keep ourselves from the destruction that is coming. And just a few things here as, as, we, as we look at this portion of Scripture. In verse 12, as, as Jesus was talking to his disciples, he was talking about some of the things that will happen. Verse uh, 6, I look down through here and it just, it's, it's just full of things. Nation rising against nation. You should hear of wars and rumors of wars and, and all these things. And it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I'm not exactly sure which all of the things that Jesus was saying was actually in the destruction of Jerusalem and which was in the end. He was talking about end times. But I am of the persuasion that verse 10, verse 11, verse 12... In verse 13, I believe Jesus is talking about the end of the age, the end of the times. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And we see some of these things happening in our day and time. And 
there are many things that will happen in the final separation. Let's, let's go to chapter 25. There could, there could be an, um, a lot said on this portion of Scripture. Um, but in the destruction of Jerusalem, if you have read about the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus mentions in this, in this Scripture about the destruction of Jerusalem, and it was one of the most horrible and gruesome things that have happened it was horrible. They pretty much self-destructed. The Romans were on the outside, and basically they just sat out there and let the Jews destroy themselves. They had enough food in the city to feed themselves for a long time. And they themselves burnt up their own food because there were warring factions amongst them. And Jesus was talking about all this. Chapter 25, verse 32. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats, and he shall set and he shall set the sheep on his right hand by the gates on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he's talking about being hunger, hungered and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, he gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. Then shall the righteous... Answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger and, and fed thee, and thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee, not, took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye shall have done it unto me. I once titled a message, The Least of These, My Brethren. And as we look, I believe that God's people here were busy in the kingdom work and they were not doing it for brownie points with God. But they were merely doing it for the kingdom of God and for his honor and for his glory, not for anything to self. And I believe that is a humility that we as a Christian people should work by. I believe that's the principles that we should work by. And then we have the people that God put on the left. And he said, insomuch as ye have not done these things unto me. And then they were like, then said they also unto him, saying, Lord, when did we see you in hunger or a thirst or stranger naked in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then he shall answer in verse 45, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not unto, unto the least of these, ye did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. So you see the vast difference in the destiny. You have the broad road and you have the narrow road. And I'm asking you tonight, which road are you on? Where there is no other road, all the people on the world, on the earth, all the people in the earth are either on the broad road or on the narrow way. There is no other. There is no middle road. I used to work with, with some people out in Oklahoma. If I would talk to them about God, they would basically make fun about go, make fun of about going to hell, and, and they're they're they're. It seemed like they just didn't comprehend. Well, I'll just turn the air conditioner on, and that type of mentality, that, that those kinds of statements. They went into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. And I, would, I, I wish that I could somehow explain to us 
the vast difference. Because I believe if we had but five seconds of realizing what hell is like and what heaven is like, there would be no there would be there would be no hesitation in making our choice for the straight and narrow way. Let's turn our Bibles now to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. I love prophetical scriptures. I love eschatology. Um, but one thing I, I, I tell people, I will not argue any of it. The Bible says, and people take things out of context and make arguments over eschatology and and it's just anyways let's turn to chapter 20 verse seven okay here we have satan who is satan The devil, and he is our arch enemy. He is the enemy because he is the one that wants to cast our soul, that wants, to, wants us to do evil and wicked. He tempts us and, and makes us do evil things. Here it says in verse 7, And when the thousand years, talks about Satan, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And I'm not, I'm not sure about this time frame. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. It says Gog and Magog together and them together to battle. The number of whom is as a sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Whose side do we want to be on? And the devil and the, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. My friends, again, question, is your name written in the book of life? If it is not, God has given us time to see us before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell among men a great hail out of heaven, and every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. One thing I'd like to notice here is a great earthquake. One thing I've found out, and I've had an experience 
with a fairly strong earthquake is that earthquakes tend to draw people's attention to God. Why is that? Because people fear the judgment of God, knowing that in the end, it says there will be an earthquake like never before, like has, like has never been before. It says, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And I remember 3 o'clock in the morning when that earthquake hit, I was laying in bed face down, and when that earthquake hit, I just wanted to melt into my bed. No security anywhere. It was like this church house. There is no security that this church house would even stand an earthquake. That it might fall down upon us. We would run for the outside for safety. But there is no place of security. We actually slept outside in our Land Rover and on the trailer for probably a week or two. I don't remember exactly, but at least a week because of the aftershocks. But what happened in that earthquake is that there were people in the dance halls. And when that earthquake hit, they were out on the streets begging God for mercy. What brought them to this point? They knew God. They knew about God. God was speaking, and God still speaks today. We hear of earthquakes happening around us. One of these days, there will be an earthquake such as has never been before. And it will become at a time when you think not. And there will be no recourse. A sudden flood of events. Are we ready? Or are we not? Tonight, I would like to challenge you. If you do not know God, I will challenge you, prepare to meet your God. And for the saints, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. If you do not know God as a sin, if you do not know God and you're a sinner tonight, I want you to think about what I've just said. For we as saints, we have something else to think about. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verses uh, 9. This is John the Revelator. And God had revealed to him many things. And here in verse 9, he, well, in, in verses prior to this, he's talking about each of the tribes of of, uh, of Israel and he says after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues they stood before the throne before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, nor any cold, if you please, as we see around us. 
For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away te all the tears from their eyes. And when I think about this wonderful place, when I think about this wonderful place that is prepared for God's people, it is wonderful because we are not only the presence of God, but Jesus is going to be our shepherd. As he leads us here, we will physically, our soul will be in the presence of Jesus and he will feed us. That will be a wonderful time. But our preparations are made now. Serving God day and night, they are fed and led by the Lamb. It says day and night. Another scripture says there should be no night there. But anyways, we have to leave that in the hands of God. Let's turn our Bibles to chapter 21. Let's read the first 11 verses. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the for the First heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he, and he, and he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels who had seven vials full of seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show the bride the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most pre precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now I'm just going to stop reading here. We could go on and read, but it's... It, he goes on and uh, mentions the, the uh, walls and the gates and the foundations of the city, the dimensions of the city. And it mentions the, uh, the, the precious stones. And I would like to go into chapter 22 now. As I look at chapter 22, it is a description of something wonderful. You know... There's a song that says, saints love to sing about heaven. Saints love to sing about home. And as we are in this world, and we face the struggles, the temptations, and the trials, we love these songs about heaven and home because it, re it refreshes us in our hope for that which is to come. We have a pure river, uh, river in, in verse 1, water of life, clear as crystal, grit, proceeding out of, the, out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. As I think about this, 
Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this marvelous? I don't know just what other words to, to describe the things that God's people experience in these times. All I can say is let your imagination turn it loose. Imagine the wonderful gift of God that has brought us from a life of sin, a life of destruction, to a life of hope in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 6, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. He that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And he said, See, thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant of thy, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. So you see, John thought this was an angel. But he was from heaven. And he said, Don't do it. Don't worship me. I am your fellow servant. Then he told him, seal not the sayings of this book. For the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And he says, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, sorcerers, warmongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David. And the bright and morning star and the spirit and the bride say, come, the invitation, come. And let him that heareth come and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will let him and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto any, any, to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things, to the things which are written in this book. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. And this is one, another thing I would like to emphasize is the last few verses that we read, verse 18 and 19, is that beware lest we take the word of God and we add to the word of God. And even in the Old Testament, there are a number of scriptures that the Lord warned his, the prophets or the people, beware lest you add or take away from my word. Because the word is sure, it is pure, it is right, it is good, it is the word, and we dare not add to or take away. And he which testifies these things saith, Surely I come. If we are here tonight, and know not God, I challenge you by the word of God and the authority of his word. It doesn't matter what age, does not make a difference. As long as we know right from good, right from wrong. 
We are at the age of accountability. I believe God is still speaking. God is still a God of grace. He has still given us time to come before him and confess him as Lord of our life. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our holy God and Father, as we come before you, Lord, this evening, we recognize your holiness, your righteousness, and that you have prepared a place for those that love you. Such a wonderful place. And dear Heavenly Father, as we face this life, we face Satan and his temptations, the trials that are brought our way, put before us. Lord, help us to take your word and use these as stepping stones in our Christian walk. Should there somebody be here tonight that does not know you, Lord, speak to that soul. That they would be able to make the choice for you. We ask, Lord, we know that you are faithful and that you know each and every heart. Lord, you know the innermost, our innermost being. So we pray, Lord, if we have confessed you as Lord and Savior and still have sin in our life, Lord, now is the time to confess and repent. So we ask that you would just go in amongst these pews in the hearts of each one try our hearts to see if there be any wicked way within us. So with eyes closed,